Hi guys, hope you're well. It's great to be outside, it's great to be free. But imagine if you weren't free, imagine if you were banged up for a crime that you did not commit and you've been banged up for 36 years. Well, that man is Clive Freeman and he's 80 years old, he's suffering from cancer and he hasn't got long to live. This is a man who could have got out years ago, years ago, if he just admitted that he was guilty, but because he wasn't, he won't admit it. This is a man that the system cannot break. So we've got an interview now with two people, two people that are very close to him. One who was in prison with him and the other a man who devoted his life to get innocent people out so it's worth a watch hope you enjoy it I'm joined by two very uh esteemed people here today one is uh, terry wilcock who knows uh clive freeman very very well and was inside with him and the other is uh, professor michael norton who deals with uh, miscarriages of justice um i want to start with you terry so so why was clive inside and and you know what, what what's the whole deal with this okay clive was inside for a murder of uh, Alexander Hardy. Clive was convicted of his murder in 1989 and has been in prison ever since, despite uh, a lot of evidence which has come to light to prove that the uh, Mr Hardy wasn't murdered, actually died of natural causes due to alcohol and drugs. Now, I know you can't talk exactly about a lot of the details of that, but tell us about your experience inside and how Clive coped with this uh this miscarriage of justice? I was serving a sentence of 10 years, conspiracy to manufacture cannabis. And at the back end of that sentence, I was allowed uh, six months cate category D status. And so the, uh, the nearest category D prison, which could accommodate me, uh, was in Gloucester. I first met Clive in the dining hall, which was about 1,500 inmates sat in the dining hall. And I was actually looking for somebody of Clive's description for another reason, which is another story. I sat beside Clive and I thought that Clive was this person. And I asked him if there was art classes in the prison. Clive didn't really acknowledge. He looked at me and then carried on eating his food. As it transpired, I was new to the prison and it uh, came to light that uh, HMP Lay Hill was actually 85% nonces. Uh, sex offenders. I mean, some of us can associate with those type of people and some of us cannot. And I, I'm one of those who, who cannot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I actually despise anybody who's done anything wrong to uh, men, uh, children uh, and women, in some mm -hmm. cases men. I was very careful who I spoke to too, and it seems that Clive had been like that for, for years. Uh, he'd been in prison by that time for 25 years. It didn't acknowledge me, so I uh, I used to do a lot of running around the prison. I was a you know I was a bit of a, bit of a fitness fanatic, and one evening, one dark evening in November, I seen him walking and in, uh, talking into a dictaphone. So I uh, I got beside him. I heard his accent was uh, uh, South African, so it was not the guy I was looking for. But I was intrigued by him because he was always alone. And then I met him in the library. Eventually, I got him to speak with me. I explained what I was in for, and he told me what he was in for. And then we got to talking about um, him being not guilty for his crime of murder. Now, at any point, he could have said, oh, actually, I'm guilty, and he, he would have got out. It, it, why was he just so determined not to do that? It could, have, it could have been released uh, after 13 years, that was his tariff. He made a promise to his wife that he would not leave prison until he was truly exonerated uh, and a free man, and he's kept to that promise ever since. So, but he had to mix with lots of sort of criminal types. You, you were saying to me uh, before that there were a lot of name people that he was uh, having to associate it with in the prisons. Yeah, he'd been, uh, been uh, to a lot of category prisons from the beginning of his sentence until eventually he was uh, uh, allocated a cat D. He's been in that HMP Lay Hill living with all those nonsense for 15 years, which must have been, which must have been terrible for him. Torture. Well, what's his, um, what's his mental health like? I mean, if you've got to deal with that every day, you know that you're innocent uh, and then you're stuck with all these uh, the nonsense and everything else like that. Uh, I mean, how difficult is that? He's very strong in mind and body, and uh, uh, he uh, concentrates constantly on his appeal. He's always he's got an encyclopedia of mind in relation to names, memories, times, dates. 
He keeps his self to his self. He goes to the library, then he goes to his cell. But basically, he lives day by day, just living in hope that he will get justice. Now, um, I'll be on to the professor just in, in, in a moment, but um, was there any point that you saw him in sort of complete despair where you thought he might actually give up? Yeah, he misses animals. He said to me, he said to me recently, he said, Terry, if I don't see this to the end, I want you, when asked about me, uh, who I was and what I was, I just want you to say, uh, Clive Freeman was a nice man who loved animals. I know also that he's thinking that he might not see the day of light because he's all, already arranged for, for to be cremated. He's paid on a budget uh, company that organises cremations. He's paid for that, £1,300. He's saved up and paid for that. He's, he's instructed Sandra Fernandez what to do with his ashes. I said, I'll take those ashes back to uh, Zimbabwe and do what you want me to do with those. And I really wanted to do that and meet his family. But he said he's already taken care of it. So he's planning the end. Uh, hopefully this last, I mean, Michael Norton will talk about the, the last CCRC application he is ever going to see. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's living now in hope and, and prayer. Okay, so uh, Professor Michael Norton, thanks very much for, for being on here. You get, obviously, a lot of sort of people writing to you to say that they're innocent in prison uh, and stuff. How do you pick out and why did you pick out Clive Freeman as someone to look at? Thank you, Liam. Yeah, I mean, I've been working on alleged wrongful conviction cases now for 20 years. <clears throat> and I think the hardest part of the work that I do is filtering out all those people who are saying they're innocent when they're not from those people who might be. And as a kind of a rule of thumb, I kind of think there's probably 95% of people who write to me, I find out one way or another are not innocent. And it might be that people are convicted in joint enterprise crimes and they say, well, I might be guilty of attempted robbery, but I'm not guilty of murder. And we don't get involved in those kind of cases. I only get involved in actual innocence cases. And so when, when I saw the name, it jumped off the page at me. I've got to be honest, I mean, I get so many letters I remember going home that night thinking, Freeman, what an odd name for a fella to be in prison for 30 years, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Clive's been writ wrote to me first 10 years ago, and it kind of, it, it stuck in my mind. But we never worked in his case because he had lawyers, he had an application going into the CCRC. We try to help people who've got nobody, right? So he didn't really register more than the name. I remember talking to students about him, saying, you know, this man's been in prison for 30 years. He could have come out 15 years ago had he admitted his guilt, but he's just steadfast. And we call that the parole deal, right? So long-term prisoners on indeterminate sentences have to satisfy their sentence plans, as your viewers and listeners will know well. And uh, he, just, he just caught up in the parole deal and people die in prison because they won't admit to things they didn't do. And why I'm interested in that is because off air, we were talking about my real interest is real crime, true crime. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I teach critical criminology. And my interest in wrongful convictions is basically because some of the highest profile miscarriage of justice cases have been terrorism, murders, kidnapping children, raping children and murdering them. And if these people are telling the truth, it means the person who did that is still out there. And I'm also interested in all of the crimes that actually are committed by police officers and prosecutors and witnesses in the conviction of innocent people, right? So I'm just, this whole thing is saturated in trying to understand crime and society and punishment for me. Absolutely, and, and what are the chances of him actually being released? Well, it's, it's a grim subject. I wouldn't want to talk about this in front of Clive, but his, his, his chances are very slim. I mean, as far as I'm aware, uh, and I think I'm 100% certain on this, the Criminal Case Review Commission has never referred a fifth application back to the Court of Appeal. So he's had four applications so far rejected. And this body that looks into these alleged wrongful convictions, it only refers cases back if it thinks the case will be overturned. And it only refers cases back if he thinks it's fresh evidence of his innocence. So the CCRC isn't saying Clive isn't innocent. It's just saying it doesn't think the Court of Appeal will overturn his conviction. Yeah, but so, would they, I mean, I understand that he's got really ill health now. And uh, I don't know whether that's terminal. I'm not too up to date on, on that. Uh, yeah. Is there not sort of compassionate grounds that he can be released? 
Well, again, because of the nature of his crime that he's been convicted of, he wouldn't have got bail for that. He wouldn't have been on remand. Uh, he would have been held on remand. <clears throat> so the thing is about Clive is because of his stance, mm -hmm. I mean, he could have been released in 2001 or two, as far as I'm aware, if he'd have admitted his guilt. And because he won't admit his guilt, they can't release him on compassionate grounds. We've looked into compassionate grounds, and it's to do with his family don't live within close proximity. They're all over in South Africa and Zimbabwe. So there's no, like, familial or family connection to give him compassionate grounds. So we asked to overturn his conviction. He's got prostate cancer. Apparently, it's flaring at the moment. It might be the stress that's triggering that. But the Criminal Case Review Commission have accepted the fifth application, and they said that they're going to give it a priority status, and we're just hoping that it does something it hasn't done before. So there is hope, but I think it's quite a, a slim hope. I mean, that takes something to be in there for that length of time when you're actually innocent, when you could actually just say, all right, yeah, I did it. I did it, folks, uh, even though he didn't, uh, and, and, and leave. And he's prepared oh. to actually die in jail, die in, in jail because he knows that he's innocent. And that has meant that he hasn't seen his family for many, 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 many years. I believe they weren't even allowed in the country to see him. So this is a really vindictive government system, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> there's a number of words we could use about this, right? We could say he's a stubborn old cuss, right? We could say that, right? Or <clears throat> equally, we could say this is a man of great integrity, mm -hmm. right? This is a man who's not prepared. I hear all the time from people who go, I was innocent in prison, but I admitted I did it to get out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I believe him, right? Because I know Paul Blackburn, who spent 25 years in prison maintaining innocence, right? He served double his time in prison. <clears throat> I know Robert Brown. He spent double the time in prison. He would have spent if he'd have admitted his guilt. When I speak to people like that, they go, my word means everything to me. And they say, hey, when you're in prison, you don't have anything but your word, right? So these men said... I will die in prison. And Clive is in that category of men that is not prepared. His word means everything to him. You know, like people say, you know, here's my hand, here's my heart or whatever. And they mean it. This is a man who, when he was in the military, he got away. He was a horseback uh, military in uh, former uh, Rhodesia. And he saw one of his friends, one of his comrades, his horse got shot and they were still being fired upon. And Clive went by and Rick, Rick went back and risked his own life. He's now campaigning for Clive. Um, he went back and risked his life for his friend. Well, what a friend then, just, a cop, uh, just somebody who's a fellow soldier. This is a man who's got that integrity. And our system, it just can't deal with people who stand up against it and say, I am not backing down. Mm -hmm. And you can kill me and you can put me on, he's on minimum rations all the time. He doesn't get enhanced status. He's living on no money. He just spends all his money on stamps and he has two or three sachets of coffee a week as a little treat. Yeah. He has no perks, no privileges, nothing, but they can't break him, right? This is a man who won't be broken. And that tells you the power of, of, of human beings when we stand up against the system. And if one of us can, can, can do that, imagine when we all stand up together and we go, we're not having it. So we're asking people to sign this petition to reform the CCRC so that it can actually help people like Clive. He's not the only one maintaining innocence in prison, but he's the longest serving prisoner who's a victim of the parole deal and the system's intransigent to admit that it gets it wrong. Now, we haven't talked yet about why Clive is innocent. Mm -hmm. And we invite people to look at this article I've written and a press release I've written. It's only a couple of pages. Mm -hmm. And there's nine global experts now and a Professor Kroll from the United States, he's done 2,000 experiments since the killing of George Floyd mm -hmm. because it's claimed that Clive Freeman knelt on this man, Alex Harde, and suffocated him, asphyxiated him. Mm -hmm. And Kroll says, even if Clive Freeman had knelt on Alex Harde with all of his weight, it would have represented about 10% of the weight required to asphyxiate. The man wasn't murdered. He died of natural causes. And they've pinned a murder onto someone that didn't even happen. Yeah, so this is horrific. So as you say, well, what can people do? They can go and sign a petition, which I'll put the link in below, which I believe has only got a few days left on it. We have. And, and I mean, I don't hold out much. I don't believe in petitions, if I'm honest. No. I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage the government. 
right? We've got no real expectation that they're going to just change things tomorrow. Well, I don't think the system is broken. I think it works the way it does by design. That's where I stand. Mm -hmm. But if we can get 10,000 signatures, the government have to answer us. They have to reply to us, right? Mm -hmm. And if they reply to us, it gives us something else to engage with to expose the fact that they don't actually care about innocent people rotting in prison. And they don't care about the fact, in other cases, that when somebody is innocent in prison, the real people, the real criminals are still out there. Absolutely. So if we don't like nonsense, right, and if we don't like murderers, we need to listen to these people when they're saying they're innocent, because if they are innocent, and I'm very happy to say I find most people actually are not innocent, but I, I, I see my workers trying to settle claims of innocence one way or the other. And if I find out that somebody who's in prison for a crime did do it, I still think it's good work because mm. we've settled the claim of innocence, right? If you, if you had a message for Clive now, if you were speaking directly to Clive now, what, what would you say to kind of keep him going in this situation? Starting with you, Michael. Well, I'd just say to him, he's inspirational, right? There's so many people hear about this story and hear about the integrity of this man that won't cave into a system that's trying to break him. And I just think, stand firm, we could actually get him through this time. I think there is a chance, it's a slim chance, but I think he should still be hopeful. Fantastic. And Terry, what, what would you say to your, your ex-mate uh, in, in, in prison? I would say, Clive, stick in there, hold on. You've fought the battle of battles uh, in the field and, and in your current state in prison. Hold on. I made that promise to you in December 2013. I'm still holding to it. I'll never let you down. I'll stick there till the end. And even if you go, I will still fight to clear your name for your family. And the stigma it's had on your family back over in uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa. So hold in there, my friend. Uh, we'll get there. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you very much, both of you, for your very informed and passionate views. And folks, you know, if you want to support this, there will be a link for the, in the petition uh, below. So do sign that. It's only going to take you two minutes. So thank you very much for both of you for uh, chatting with us today.